Buenos dias, all things CyberTile. CyberTile with you. I am House Ravenclaw. Uh, if you don't like it, you can just close the video now, because that's what house I am. Got some DeSorono, because I'm a fancy bird. This is going to be the last video we're going to do in terms of White's perspective, in terms of how to handle the Isolated Queen Pawn. We're going to finish up how to handle pure peace attacks in an Isolated Queen Pawn structure. Um, I thought it was fitting that we pick a game by Mikhail Tao to finish up, because in my opinion, he was the absolute best pure peace attacker of all time. Um, I think there was a better overall attacker. I think Kasparov is the greatest attacker of all time. Um, but he involves quite a bit of pawn play in his uh, attacks. I think Tal a lot of times didn't even use pawns, maybe even unless the, it was just a sacrifice off the board to make room for his pieces. He could just, by sheer peace maneuvering, create so many complications and so, many, and so much pressure and just pull complications out of nowhere and overwhelm his opponent. It was just uh, Tal in his prime from the early 50s to early 60s was just an absolute force of nature. We'll never see any, maybe never see anything like that again. Um, but this is a game Mikhail Tal played towards the end of his life, so it's not peak Mikhail Tal. Um, if anyone's familiar with the personal story of his life, he had serious health issues more or less his entire life. When he won the world championship in 1960, um, he had a diseased kidney that haunted uh, his body for most of his life until he finally had it removed in the late 60s. Um, he lost the rematch in 61 when by all, all accounts he should have been in a hospital bed somewhere, but he forced himself to play. He didn't want to have the next doctors examine him. Um, once his kidney was removed in the uh, late 60s, that sort of led to a renaissance in his play. Uh, the late 60s, early 70s, he had sort of a, a resurgence where his aggressive play was sort of fused with a more mature positional understanding, where it was sort of a considered a peak Mikhail Tao. Two of the longest undefeated streaks of all time are held by Mikhail Tao, which is sort of surprising when you consider how aggressive his style was. Um, but Mikhail Tao smoked like a chimney and drank like no one else, which I'm somewhat in sympathy with. Uh, but it really wore his body out. Uh, by the time he died in 1992, he was extraordinarily gaunt. Uh, it was sad to see, but he played chess up until the end of his life, and he still created masterpieces up until the end of his life. So we're going to look at one of those last ones here. This was against Roman Gingigashvili. Um Yes, I can spell that name without having to look it up. Get on my level. Um, Tal played e4. c5, net of 3, knight c6. C3. So this is another good example of how you can get an isolated queen pawn um, out of an e4 pawn opening. Understanding an isolated queen pawn is essential to understanding chess. Um, it is sad to see Mikhail freaking Tal playing an anti-Sicilian. Uh, if it were Tal of early 1950s, he would have played d4 and absolutely swept Junikashvili off the board in 30 moves. Um, but this was Tal a year before he passed away, so this is a Definitely more reserved, Mikhail Tao. Uh, so c3, d5. This is one of two major ways of facing the c3 Sicilian. It's been a problem for me most of my life, trying to find an adequate uh, repertoire solution against c3. Not because uh, good solutions don't exist, because they're due. Uh, the problem is that c when you're playing as black in a Swiss tournament, which is basically all I play, uh, a draw isn't good enough. You have to win games as black. And it's hard to find winning chances against the C3 Sicilian if White doesn't want to play aggressively. If White just wants to sit back and play an equal position, it's hard to find a line against the C3 Sicilian that really grabs a lot of winning chances. So that's been the struggle all my life. I, I am playing D5 right now because I think it generates the most imbalances and the most winning chances. Um, by that token, it creates more imbalances and winning chances for White as well but I certainly don't mind that. Um, the other major line is knight f6 instead. e5, knight d5, d4. Um, this can lead to an isolated queen pawn as well. Uh, not guaranteed. d5 more or less guarantees that we will have an isolated queen pawn on the board for white. Uh, so, ed, queen d, d4, cd. This isn't the most accurate unless it's followed up with a very precise move. Uh, the two major continuations here, knight f6, this is probably the theoretically soundness. It leaves a lot of flexibility in Black's position. Most aggressive is Bishop G4. Um, this is a line I'm sort of fond of, and it's one of my uh, 
one of my lines that I can choose against this T3 Sicilian. Very ag aggressive line. Uh, when you consider wanting to pressure an isolated queen pawn, suddenly black's got three pieces, or two pieces aimed at d4, and the third attacking one of the guardians of d4, and black's already re ready to follow this up with something like rook d8, or even cancel queenside. Um, so this is a very aggressive line against the c3 Sicilian. It's great to choose if you need winning chances. Um, but cd was played. Uh, cd. e6, not the most precise. Just sort of leads to a slightly worse isolated queen pawn for black. If black does take on d4, it's usually play e5 here. And I'll just give that uh, opening line here real quick. That's usually the point of how uh, black taking on d4 so early. Um, white is very slightly better here. He's got the bishop pair. Um, but usually black plays this to draw the game. And he's more than usually successful because it's a pretty staid position. But if anyone ever does win, it's usually white just because it's bishop pair. Um, but black doesn't play that. He just plays e6. Um, this is just going to be a slightly worse isolated queen pawn. So here, knight c3, the queen drops back to d6. Um, we really haven't seen a queen on d6 in these isolated queen pawn positions, because it really only ever pops up in the c3 Sicilian isolated queen pawns. Uh, these have a little bit different flavor than the d4 queen pawns, because you do have that early queen x d5. Um, Black plays queen d6 to try to claim that his queen is somehow useful in d6. I'm not sure I buy it. There, there are a couple reasons why it might be useful, but there are also a couple of use reasons why it might just be worse on d6. Um, but the problem is, if the queen drops back all the way to d8, um, basically, it's the analogous isolated queen pawn position whites a full tempo up, just from the queen x d5, and then the queen right back to d8. Uh, so it's a full loss of time for black rather than just slightly a partial time. Uh, so queen d6 tries to claim that it's at least somewhat useful there. Uh, bishop d3, as usual, bishop c4 should be seriously looked at, um, since so this will be the last time, or the last video in the series where we're looking from white's perspective. Uh, we'll do sort of a brief review as we go through. Remember, your first order of operations when you're playing with an isolated pawn, you want to check to see whether d5 is possible as a pawn break. Ideally, you want to push that pawn forward and open up the lines for your more aggressive pieces. Uh, so because no pe black pieces are controlling d5 here, you should at least consider bishop c4, because uh, it does make d5 possible. And just an example of what white can do from here, castle. And queen e2. Uh, this is a line I give in the analysis, and you can check the annotated PGN file as usual. It's not really takeable. I'll show that line real quick. And th this, is a hu this is a humongous in initiative for white for a pawn. Uh, black can't even get castled from this position just yet. Um... Uh, but on castle, white can just play rook d1. Um, and in this sort of position, black has to probably immediately put his knight on d5 just to manually prevent a d5 from being played. And this is just a good normal isolate queen pawn. I would say it's slightly better for white, just since the queen on d6 doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, but bishop d3, normal isolate queen pawn move, of course. Knight f6, castle, b3, 7 rook e1. Um, Standard move for the isolated pawn, of course. It's where the rook belongs. Um, because that queen on d6 is there, um, it does change a little bit about this position. Sometimes white can profit from something random, like a, a quick knight b5 and bishop f4. But by and large, this is going to play largely the same as a standard isolated queen pawn. So castle. Bishop g5. Uh, probably a3 was a little bit better, just to prevent anything from popping to b4. E6 and then bishop e3. The bishop on g5 doesn't isn't necessarily mandatory, and in these positions, the upside of the queen on d6 is that rook d8 pressures the d4 pawn immediately. So uh, white can move this bishop to e3 to, to protect his uh, isolated pawn, and then build his battery with bishop c2 and queen d3. Um, yeah, bishop b7, then maybe queen d, uh, queen e2, and this is just a normal isolated queen pawn position. This is. Just a matter of taste. Uh, but bishop g5, there's nothing wrong with it. Maybe just not the most accurate. Queen d2. And now queen a... Queen, a rook d8. And now queen e2. This is sort of a classic Tal move. It's a just a pure sacrifice. Uh, white doesn't even get anything concrete for it. He just gets, sort of gets open position and gain of time. It's sort of that classic Tal semi-correct sacrifice. 
Um, Jinshashvili declines. He plays knight b4. Um, this is flat out incorrect. Now, one concept we've seen in a few of the games um, that we've gone over recently is that having both your knights aiming on b4, uh, aiming at d5, really isn't a huge accomplishment. Uh, one knight is more than enough. Uh, the, Black doesn't just want to control d5. If he devotes his entire position to controlling d5, it means he doesn't have any play for himself. He needs to be devoting his position to controlling the square in front of the pawn, of course, but once that's controlled, he needs to spend the rest of his energy looking, looking for and developing counterplay. Um, if not knight b4, I mean, h6 is probably a little bit better if he doesn't want to take the pawn, but he really should just take the pawn. Um, it's not it's not immediately losing, and by and large, you want to make your opponent prove what he's saying. If your opponent's offering you material, if you don't see a reason why not, take it and make him prove it. Uh, knight takes, queen takes, four, knight d5, and white has compensation for sure. Uh, he's got better development, he's basically perfectly mobilized, um, but it's just compensation. It's not, not a forced win at all. Um, there's plenty of play from here. Um, so... I would say sort of the magic of Tal's name, even then, in the last year of his life, uh, sort of held back Jinjashvili from taking that pawn. Uh, so knight b4, bishop c4, of course he doesn't want to let black take that light square bishop. Bishop d7. Rook d1, not the only move. a3 is another good isolated pawn move. And then one concept we looked at at the beginning, this would be actually be the right time to transition to symmetry here based on tactics. Knight xd5. And this is strictly based on that bishop on e7 being completely undefended at the end of a lot of lines. So ed, bishop d3, of course, if white uh, takes on e7, this is just an even trade. This doesn't necessarily accomplish anything. Uh, but bishop d3, now we are threatening to take on e7. Bishop b6, knight d5. And this is a favorable position for white for sure. Um, the pawn structure is symmetrical, and in a symmetrical pawn structure, the only thing that matters is peace mobilization and peace activity. And in this particular position, each white piece is better than its black counterpart. The knight in e5 is better than the knight f6. Both white bishops are better than their black counterparts. Uh, the rook in e1 is very well placed. The rook in a8, th those two are more or less equal. But basically, every white piece is better than its counterparts. Um, and white can just sort of build on that. He could potentially play something like f4, f5, um, play queen, uh, bishop c2 and queen d3, the usual uh, battery builder. Or he could just move his other rook to uh, the c file and play just simple chess. Uh, or bishop f4 and threaten a, a discovery on the black queen. Um, his position has a lot of flexibility just because it's based on pure peace maneuvers. Um, but white played rook a d1. I think a3 is a little bit better just because it's a sure advantage, whereas it's a little bit more liquid. Um, but it's not a bad move at all. Uh, so bishop c6, again, as I said earlier, and we've seen it a few times in this video, controlling d5, it's important, but once black does so, he needs to actually be developing his own play. You can see here black is basically devoting his entire position to controlling the square in the front of the pawn instead of generating his own counterplay. Black needs to generate his own play. He needs to pressure the isolated pawn, where he needs to get some sort of play going on the queen side. If he doesn't achieve either of those and he just sits on a d5 square, white's just going to build up his king side attack at leisure and not just break through. Um, so bishop c6, not a fan of it. h6 I prefer. And then just rook a c8. Uh, in this position, if not e5, just like in the game, black can play or like, like a recommendation in the actual game. Bishop b8 is a common move in these scenarios to help shore up the sensitive f7 pawn. Uh, should bishop c6, because bishop e8 is so common, can be seen as a loss of tempi in some situations as well. Um, so white plays knight e5, that's where the knight belongs in isolated queen pawns, of course. And then bishop d5. This is really the first clear error of the game. Um, again, conceptually, it, it doesn't work. You don't want to be over-controlling the d5 square like this. You need to be generating your own play. You also don't want to give away the bishop pair when your opponent's gearing up for an attack. That's asking for an even stronger attack, because your opponent will just have the bishop pair to use against you. Um, also, tactically, this just doesn't work. So, uh, bishop b8, first we'll cover the correct move. Bishop b8, I think, is the best move here. It covers that sensitive f7 pawn. 
the bishop looks a little bit strange here. But from this position, other than d5, which just doesn't work tactically or conceptually, there's no better place for the bishop. Uh, d7 clogs at the d-file. a4 and b5 are impossible. So bishop e8 just sort of tucks the bishop out of harm's way. It gives a, a useful defensive chore. Um, also in these positions, black can then play g6, and then the bishop on e8 sort of holds up the entire pawn structure on the king side by giving x-ray protection to every square there. Um, so that bishop can be defensive here in a lot of positions. Um, so that, that, that is the better move. Bishop d5 just doesn't work. Uh, Tal takes on d5. This, is, this misses a clear opportunity. Um, and this is a fairly simple uh, concept as well. So a3 is correct here. Um, if the bishop takes, knight takes, and then white just wins a piece. So the knight has to drop back to c6. And then just very simple chess. Um, this is absolutely the correct... Uh, time to transition to symmetry, because this is in a very favorable position for White. Uh, White's got the bishop pair. Both his bishops are extraordinarily strong. You know, bishop on a2 is going to drop back to b1 and help attack the king side. The bishop on g5 can either eliminate the bishop knight on f6 to eliminate guardian of h7, or can go to f4 and unleash an attack on the black queen. Um, and White can just play simple chess. He can just play bishop b1, queen d3, then he can lift his rook from e3 over to g3 or h3 and help assault the king's side. Uh, white is a very strong position, and this is um, not necessarily winning, but it's a pretty good position for whites. Uh, one example line I gave was h6, queen d3. And yeah, white has very simple threats here, just building up his attack on the king's side. Just bishop b1, rook e3, rook g3. He can move the other rook to the e-file. Basically, he can just build up a huge attack on the king's side. And black doesn't have any play here because all of his pieces are quite passive. Um, so a3 was missing a huge opportunity here. Um, so knight takes, knight bd5. This, we actually see a bunch of times in our video, the video series so far, that the b knight going to d5 or the b knight taken on d5 just isn't correct. Um, this configuration of the knights being on f6 and d5, it looks pretty because it looks like you've got everything on lockdown. But it doesn't accomplish anything positive for black. It doesn't create any threats. It doesn't create any counterplay. Um, that's what you need to do against the isolated pawn. Because otherwise, white's just going to be building up his kingside attack. And you're going to be sitting there with a pretty but passive position. Uh, knight fd5 was correct. And we also, we've also seen this theme a few times in our previous games. Because uh, it actually accomplishes something. It challenges the bishop on g5. So it prevents white from building up for at least a move. The knight mb4 prevents the rook lift. It prevents rook d3, prevents bishop d3. Um, it's a strongly posted knight. Um, I gave some example lines. I'll leave, I'll leave the sub notes uh, to look over on your own time. But the main line I gave was h4, which is a standard move. You want to try to get the king side moving. And white's got a little bit of an advantage, but this is this is certainly a fight. You know, black can try to prove that the pawn on g5 is a weakness instead of a strength. Um, but knight f x d5 is absolutely the correct way. This move is simply just way too passive. So rook d3, because white has no threats to deal with, he just gets his next piece into the attack, and this is going to be de decisive. You could always count on Mikhail Tal to include all of his pieces in the attack. Uh, h6. This is at, this is very much asking for as strong attack as possible. Thematically, we see whenever a rook lift is involved, the move h6 becomes very dangerous because then the g7 and h6 squares become very very weak. Um, conversely, logically, if you if you see h6 in these positions as white, that could be your mnemonic device to look seriously at a rook lift with rook d3 to try to take advantage of those weaknesses on the king side. Uh, so h6, because the rook lift is already involved, this is asking for a ferocious attack. Uh, black has to try to mobilize, so rook ac8 is the correct move. Just one line I give, bishop d2, knight f8. And this is what black wants to do when he's not moving pawns in front of his king side. He wants to uh, reorganize his pieces for the defense. So the knight hops back to f8 to lock down guardianship of h7, so he doesn't need to move that pawn. When you're defending, you want to try to avoid pawn weaknesses. You want to try to avoid pawn moves. Uh, the problem with h6 is that it creates hooks for attacks. It creates hooks for sacrifices, as we shall see. Um, 
So yeah, h6 is an outright blunder. Uh, Tal blade, bishop c1. Uh, white's still better after this move, but young Mikhail Tal would not have played bishop c1. He would have played bishop x h6. And he would have played it probably in about 30 seconds or so. Um, this is completely thematic for these rook lift sort of positions. Uh, when you play a rook lift and isolate queen pawn, and black has h6 in, these are the moves you need to be analyzing first. You need to analyze bishop x h6, rook x g7, those sorts of sacrifices to open things up. And here it's decisive. Uh, g takes, rook g3. King f8 is the main line. I'll just get the main line to, so the video doesn't become too long. But queen d2. And there's this very interesting worming effect here. So queen d2 threatens the opponent h6, knight g8, and then queen c2, and then the queen just sort of shifts its way into black's position. So now white is threatening queen h7, so that needs to be prevented. Um, bishop f6 is the main line. If the black tries to prevent it, queen c1. And once again, there's this interesting step stair idea. Uh, knight f6, and then queen f5. Uh, white's only got a pawn for the piece, but he has an overwhelming initiative for it. Um, one example I gave, queen b4, g3, and white has overwhelming threats. Um, he can play knight xf7, then take an e7 the next move. Uh, he can play knight g4, uh, uncover the black king side like that. Uh, this is an overwhelming position for white. Uh, he has a humongous attack for merely a pawn. Uh, so bishop f6 is my main analy analytical line here, and then knight xf7. And if Tal had this position, he would have played that move in about five seconds. This is just the heart and soul of this position is these sort of sacrifices. Um, I won't give the correct main line, but just to show you what happens if when black accepts. Queen x, and then smashes through. So... Um, the rest of the analysis is in the PGN notes. I'd encourage you to check the notes for the video to look at that. Uh, but bishop xh6 is just the thematic move for a position like this. And uh, Old Mikhail Tal didn't play it. He played it safe, but young Mikhail Tal would have played that. Lickety split. Uh, but bishop, bishop c1, white's still better. Rook ac8, rook g3, aiming the rook down. Uh, King f8. This doesn't actually stop... The sacrifice. It just makes it so the sacrifice doesn't have to come with check. Um, but it's it's hard for white or black to find a good move here. Uh, the desperation heave would be h5. This tries to keep control over some squares on the king side uh, to show you how it stops the sacrifice in g7. And it stops it through this. So now the, the square in g4 is guarded, so if knight xg4 queen xg3, and suddenly a black is winning. Um, now, white's certainly much better, because that pawn in h5 is a humongous weakness. Um, and black, uh, white's certainly going to maneuver and uh, break through black's king side, but at least black can continue the game. King f8 uh, simply allows immediate death. Uh, bishop b3, this gives away all of white's advantage, actually. This should be an equal position like this. Um... Young Tao would have played Vishba XH6 move a couple moves earlier. Young Tao most certainly would have just smacked out Rook XG7 here just instantly. Because he would have seen this piece geometry in about five seconds. I, I saw it in about 30 seconds. So an actual genius would see it much sooner. Uh, Rook XG7 just tears Black's position apart. And then the follow-up, Vishba XH6. And this is wholly built on the geometry of this knight fork in F7. Um, getting back the black uh, black queen for white's material investment. Um, I don't want to go over all the variations, but I'll give one of them real quick. Um, King g8, uh, declining the bishop on h6. Uh, queen f3. This is similar to the variation we just looked at a little bit ago, except there's no pawn on h5. So now queen g3 simply threatens mate. Queen h uh, King h7. Queen g3 threatens mate. If the black king takes, then this is going to be mate next move. So rook g8, bishop b3, knight e4, then queen h3. And the next move is going to be bishop f8 mates, unless black gives up all its material to stop the checkmates.
Um, so this is Doom. Otherwise, black can take the bishop on h6. G3. Uh, and black has survived the, the initial wave, but white is most certainly winning. Uh, he's got three pawns and a queen. Um, black's got two minor pieces and a rook. Um, but his king is still extraordinarily exposed. He has a weak pawn on e6 that's most likely going to fall eventually. Um, and white's got those two passes on the king's side. So generally, black, white's plan is going to be here uh, to continue his uh, king side attack, probably something like a3, bishop a2, bishop b1, queen d3, and then advances g and h pawn as necessary, uh, just to conti continue the attack on the black king. Um, so young Tao would have seen this instantly. Uh, bishop b3 just gives away all of white's initiative. Um, so rook c7 was played not the most incisive. Uh, queen b6 would finally generate some counter threats. It would generate pressure against the d4 pawn, which would be about time. Uh, queen f3, rook d c8. Um, now the threat of taking the g7 is still alive, and now a6 completely misses that threat still works. Queen b6 not only pressures the d4 pawn, but it steps away from the uh, knight fort geometry that we saw in the previous variations. Uh, so a6 misses everything. Then rook xg7. So this fine, this still works. Uh, King xg7, bishop takes h6. So the knight fork in f7 is what what's making this whole attack work. If the queen were on b6 here, uh, the king could take on um, h6, and none of this would be working because it wouldn't win black's queen. Um, so here, um, king h7 is just flat out losing, but if black took, it would just be a slow death instead of a fast one. And it's similar to the other variation like this that we saw, but white has already won that pawn on a6. Uh, so now he has four pass pawns to push. Uh, this is overwhelming for white. Uh, but black can continue the game and hope for a blunder, especially since this is a blitz game. He could hope to flag his opponent. Um, King hf7, this is just asking for a checkmate. Uh, Queen h3, this is um, really surprising because knight xf7 is so obvious. Uh, it hits queen on d6, and queen d3 is going to be mate in two moves. So, I mean, this sort of showed how old Tal, he still had some flashes of brilliance, but he was definitely, uh, I mean, he was dealing with cancer through his entire body. So the fact that he could win any chess games is sort of a, a miracle of nature. Um, but queen h3, not the best, but he's still Tal. Uh, knight g8, this just allows him to in an awful position. He could struggle on something like this, but... Uh, knight g8, then bishop f8, and Jinja should really finally resign, because this is going to be mate's next move. Um, sort of a, a typical IQP game. Um, really, the keys to the game were earlier, where both sides were sort of choosing their plans and their configurations here. Um, notice that white had a couple of different times where he could have transitioned structures. So here, rook ad1. A3 was best because it was a good time to transition uh, to symmetrical pawn structure where his pieces were more active. Um, but really, the, the main feature of the game was Black again making this mistake of uh, over controlling d5. The goal isn't to control d5 with all of your pieces, Black. The goal is to control d5 enough to prevent d4, d5 as a pawn break. Once you have that square in front of the pawn controlled, that's when you try to generate your own play. You generate pressure against the uh, isolated pawn itself, or you generate a pressure on the queen side, or wherever you can. Um, just overprotecting d5 isn't enough. So in so many of our examples, uh, like the Botvinnik Vidmar game we looked at um, a few days ago, um, same configuration, the knights on f6 and d5, it looks pretty, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't generate any play for black, and just allows white to build up at his leisure. Um, so... Another, another classic attacking game. Uh, you can never be too bored by Mikhail Tal's games. This was the last uh, video in the series looking at White's potential. Uh, next video tomorrow, we're going to flip the board, literally and figuratively. We're going to look at how the other side would handle playing against the isolated pawn. So we're going to look at black variations and how black is supposed to play against the isolated pawn. But of course, that's applicable for White playing against an isolated pawn. So... Uh, thanks for tuning back in. My name is John, also Cybertown. I'll speak with you tomorrow.